Good morning, good afternoon, or whatever the case may be. Let me be the first to wish you a pre-happy Transfiguration Sunday as we look at this upcoming reading, namely Matthew 17, 1-9. The text itself, as you know, is relatively familiar. After all, we get a chance to preach on the Transfiguration not once, not twice, but every, every three-year lectionary three times. So we're dealing with a pretty familiar text here. And one of the challenges we have as we approach a text that we, we get a chance to preach on every year, after all, is how can we find new angles and to keep it fresh in order to have a very predictable, albeit solid, Transfiguration Day sermon. A couple ways to approach this text, and you're probably familiar with the issues that haunt us. But I'll, instead of going over some of the well, burned-over territory, I'd like us to approach this text looking at basically four paradigms, namely the where, the people, the voice, and the secret. First of all, the where. The where is extremely significant when we're dealing with the transfiguration. Note the mountain itself is not specified, but it is specified as being one a mountain, which here in Indiana is always fun to mention because we don't have the mountains, we have this thing called the horizon. Perhaps you're in a slightly better geographic location. But this mountain that's mentioned as very high is crucial. Whenever you see a mountain in the text, it's hard not to get excited. You get excited because a mountain in the Old Testament and in the New is where heaven and earth meet. When you see a mountain, rather the mountain at the Garden of Eden, Mount Sinai, mountain at the end of Revelation, take your pick. Our expectations as readers and hearers is that this is a place where God is going to act decisively in a new way. Mountains represent, after all, a meeting place of heaven and earth. So already the where is actually pretty important here. The where of the mountain and the expectations. The where, now we move from the where to the people. Peter, James, and John, yes, they're nice. Yes, they're the inner circle. But the people that are more important are the three people that matter. Jesus, of course, that should not come of any surprise. But also Elijah and Moses, who make their last cameo appearance in the canon here during the Transfiguration account. Jesus' appearance is noteworthy. Already we're set up to expect God to be acting decisively and who do we discover but God made flesh with Jesus' changing of appearance? And then we bump into these two figures who don't fit in all that well, namely Moses and Elijah. You probably know the debates. The old classic one that I was taught lo those many years ago was that this represents the law and the prophet. But this raises a deep theological question. Why some? not others. Okay, not quite the way you may be thinking of it, but why these two and not the others? Elijah himself, representing the prophets, has never set that well. Oh yes, he was a prophet, but he's not one of the writing prophets that testified to the coming of the Messiah. Rather, what these two characters have in common, Moses and Elijah, are the expectations that's that are given of both of them. Deuteronomy 18, a hopefully familiar text to you, in which Moses says that one like me will be coming after me. And then the Italian prophet Malachi, or Malachi, depending how appropriate you want to be, tells us that Elijah will come. Both of these figures, Moses and Elijah, have strong eschatological overtones, that their coming heralds the, the Messianic age namely the Messiah. So we move from the place to the people, and now item number three for those of you keeping score at home, the voice. And the voice tells us everything. This is my son. And if you hadn't figured it out yet, now you see God made flesh. You see the Son of God in all, the, in all of his divine glory transfigured before them. And the voice has a response. Peter has one of those wonderful lines. It's good for us to be here. Okay, duh. 
let's make, let's make tabernacles. Let's make shelters. Peter knows where God's glory belongs. You put it in a tent. You put it in a tabernacle. But then they're overshadowed by a cloud, yet another theophanic manifestation. And they see nothing but Jesus. So we move now from the place, to the people, to the voice, to the secret. Peter, James, and John suddenly know who Jesus is. And now they're told to tell no one. The transfiguration is this great glimmer that Jesus is truly the Son of God in all of his glory, the bringer about of the Messianic age, the bringer about of God's triumph over those big bad three, sin, death, and the devil. But the secret is kept. The secret because Jesus has not brought about his kingdom fully. You don't understand Jesus until the Son of Man suffers, dies, and is raised again. So happy Transfiguration Eve, or Transfiguration pre-day, or whatever you happen to be listening to this podcast. Play around with the place, the people, the voice, and the secret. As we prepare the people to have one last glimmer of messianic glory and triumph on Transfiguration, before we now move into that valley of Lent, looking forward to that great and high feast of Easter. May God grant you his peace, his wisdom, and his grace as you prepare to preach on this sermon this coming Sunday.